So here we are with John chapter 3 and uh, reading uh, from verses 1 to 17. Uh, Nicodemus comes to visit Jesus. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus. Now Pharisees were one of the groups of Jewish uh, religious leaders. Uh, I'm sure you know that, but I was once told by a, a member of a congregation who said, you know, whenever you mentioned the Pharisees, I thought they were some religious, some group of from another nation or somewhere. I never knew that they were part of the Jewish faith. So you've got to be careful when you use these phrases, haven't you? So now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after growing old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know, and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things, and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No, no one has ascended into heaven, except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him shall not perish, but shall have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Amen. Amen indeed. When I was a student at Cliff Bible College, I remember really struggling when the whole idea of the Trinity came up in lectures. And for a few days, you know, I really wrestled with this idea of the Trinity. Three in one, one in three, I couldn't get my head around it. How was it possible? How could I possibly understand it? If I had known at the time that Thomas Aquinas had said that our problem is the misery of language, I would have all heartedly agreed with him. Thankfully, as I got myself in a bit of a stew, God spoke and told me, stop intellectualising it, accept it, and believe it. Like Nicodemus, I was overwhelmed by a difficult theological idea, if you like, something that was, was really testing my mind. You know, for me, it was the Trinity. For Nicodemus, it was the whole idea of being born again. How was such a thing possible? What did Jesus mean? He went to Jesus for a discussion, but was overwhelmed by the words of Jesus, the Son of God. But only, and only because, God wanted to overwhelm him with love. How can you respond to, for God so loved the world that he gave his only Son? Thankfully, Nicodemus recovered from his experience. He spoke up for Jesus. To his Pharisee colleagues in, in John chapter 7. You can read all about that there in verses 45 to 52. And then later, of course, he helped Joseph of Arimathea take, uh, take Jesus' body down from the cross, anoint that body, and place it in the tomb. And I think we dare say that in the end, Nicodemus was overwhelmed by love. I also recovered, thankfully. I reclaimed my faith and took God at his word. And as I repented of my, my sin, my unbelief, the barriers of my arguments and my worldly wisdom, as it was trying to be, came crashing down, for which I'm grateful. Like Isaiah and Paul, I was forgiven. 
ready once more to respond to God's call, and again able to enjoy that wonderful experience of all being, being overwhelmed by God's love as Father, Son and Holy Spirit. The way the Trinity works is a mystery, but in the end the Trinity is simply a way of describing the three different ways in which we experience God. It's rather like that wonderful uh, children's television program that uh, you may remember from many years ago, Play School. I mean, maybe you remember when the presenter used to say, today we'll look through the round window, or the square window, or the arched window. There's always those three windows, the square window, the round window and the arch window. And my preference, I don't know why, was always for the arched window. I was sitting on the edge of my seat, thinking, let it be the arch window. Now I'm sure other children were sitting there uh, saying, let it be the, the, the round window. We each had a, a different preference. And in a way, that's like people relate to God. People have a, a different preference for the way in which they relate to God. To be true to the crucifixion, the resurrection and to Pentecost, it was important for the early church to identify God in terms of Father, Son and Holy Spirit in their relationship with him. You know, this is especially clear in, in Christian worship. You know, Christians worshipped God as Father, they worshipped God as a Son, and they worshipped God as Father and Son in the power of the Holy Spirit just as we do. And it wasn't until the 4th century that people began to talk about this relationship as the Trinity. You know, the word Trinity doesn't actually appear in the Bible, but it just seems to be the way that we came to describe this wonderful experience of being overwhelmed by God's love as Father, Son and Holy Spirit. I mean, how do you describe God? The short answer is, if, if you can't, of course. There's a lovely little story of a little girl who was busy drawing a picture one day and her mum said to her, who are you drawing? What are you drawing? And she said, I'm drawing God. And the mum said, but God's invisible. Nobody knows what he looks like. And the little girl said, they will when I've finished. You see, you know, words cannot express the wonder, the majesty and the greatness of God. And ultimately, the relationship between the Father, between Father, Son and Holy Spirit is indeed a mystery to us. But that doesn't mean that we cannot, like those first disciples, talk about the ways in which we experience God. The ways we experience God as our Heavenly Father, the way we experience God as, 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 as Jesus, the Son, and then the ways we experience God as Holy Spirit. Three different windows, if you like, through which to help us to understand how we are to live in relationship with God and with one another and experience being overwhelmed by love. So... Let's begin with Father, uh, with God as Father. You know, and here the emphasis is on God, if you like, as Creator, the one who created and sustains this astonishing, beautiful, breathtaking universe, who called creation into being, who loves us despite our failure to live for Him, to live for others, and to live for ourselves. God as Father, who offers us grace and forgiveness, and is the one to whom we can always return when we get it so badly wrong. You know, just as the prodigal son returned to his father, to his loving father. You know, remember in that story in Luke chapter 15, how the father looking for the son who was sold all his inheritance and just wasted it, squandered it on all kinds of wild living. The son eventually starving returns home and the father's there waiting for him. And instead of waiting for the son to come to him, he runs to him embraces him, puts a ring on his finger, you know, puts shoes on his feet, kills the fatty calf and throws a party. And the prodigal is overwhelmed by that father's love. Parental love, we mustn't forget, can be problematic for some of course, but even our dysfunctional, you know, often dysfunctional human relationships point to an understanding that a parent's love can and ought to be kind and nurturing, offering security and acceptance. God as our loving Father is for many people their main window on God. And God as Son, moving on, emphasises God as a human being. That's the second window on God, God as Son. 
the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Creator became a creature, living under the law, being obedient to the Father while challenging the injustice and suffering that he found in the world. You know, Jesus was filled with compassion for all who suffered while always retaining his anger at injustice. All of which, of course, led to great suffering for him. And because of his world, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus died on the cross. He was murdered by the authorities. But thankfully, Jesus overcame death and he was raised to life by the power of the Spirit. More of that in a second. But Jesus, as God, enables us to see God as our friend, as our companion, one who shares in our joys and troubles, who knows what life is like. He was tempted in every way as we are, but without sin. And always, always, Jesus is gracious and his love is overwhelming. So this window on God of Jesus as the Son opens out onto a face which is like ours, yet offers the hope that we can be better than we are, that we have an extraordinary potential for good, for fruitfulness and for love. And then God as Holy Spirit, God with us and within us. You know, the Holy Spirit makes God a reality in the here and the now. The Holy Spirit is our advocate who offers counsel and comfort. The Holy Spirit equips us with the gifts of God. Read about those in Romans 12 and Ephesians 4. The Holy Spirit enables us to work with God to build his kingdom. That's an amazing thing as well, isn't it? That God chooses to work in partnership with us. And the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin, as we sow with Isaiah, as we sow with Paul, and I'm sure we're all aware of that too. But when the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin, the Holy Spirit does not condemn us. Remember what Jesus said, he came into the world not to, con not to condemn but to save. So the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin without condemning us so that we might repent and receive forgiveness. And working with the Holy Spirit we are empowered. We are empowered to produce the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Wonderfully the Holy Spirit also prays for us with groans too deep for words. The Holy Spirit is, if you like, a clear window on God. Because the role of the Holy Spirit is not to be seen, but to help us see God as Father and Son. To experience this overwhelming love of God the Father. And to access and to enjoy the grace offered in Jesus Christ. The Trinity is bound together by love. Love which sent Son and Spirit from heaven to earth. A love which reconciles us to God and to one another through the cross. And a love which inspires us to live in a right relationship with God, with the world and with ourselves. Back to the beginning. In the year when we've been overwhelmed by the pandemic, by social media, by life in general. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it really wonderful as Isaiah, as Paul, as Nicodemus and as you and I have discovered? to be overwhelmed by love. Amen. Like Isaiah, like Paul, like Nicodemus, and like you and I, John Newton, the slave trader, was eventually overwhelmed by the love of God. And in response to that, he wrote that wonderful hymn, Amazing Grace, that saved a wretch like me. I guess it's one of my all-time favourite hymns. So that's one of the choices for you to sing now. And how do we respond to such love? Well, John tells us in his first letter that we love because God first loved us. So our second choice of hymn enables us to sing of our love for God as Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Father, we love you. 